95% of students are doing the study planning the wrong way and this is causing all the hours put into study going to waste. Now in this video, I'm about to share with you a very efficient way of study planning and how you can achieve much better grades in less time. If you are new here, welcome to the channel. My name is Hugo. I'm a study performance coach, a doctor and ex-pharmacist working in New Zealand at the moment. Now over the past eight years, I've started from one-on-one -on -one tutoring through to building online programs to help over 1,000 intern pharmacists, 1,500 100 student doctors and over 100,000 high school and university students worldwide get excellent grades by studying smarter and achieving more in less time. Now the structure of this video is designed to help you achieve study planning success in the most efficient way using this MMA framework I absolutely swear by because it had helped me and so many other students achieve success not just in their studies but also in so many areas of their lives as well. Now let's use this today to bring you efficient and effective study planning. So first of all my Mindset. This is the way your brain gets programmed to think, usually by our environment, including how we are raised and the people we surround ourselves with. Now this formed your mindset. Now imagine this 100 meter sprint athlete. If they were raised in a rural isolated village and programmed to think running backwards is the way to success and all other athletes in the rural village are training hard to run backwards, now they themselves are likely to try to work hard and find the most efficient way to run backwards. I'll start off the first section covering this because the right mindset then lets us generate more efficient thoughts and make better decisions with our study time and ultimately get better results in less time. So the second part is methods. Now I don't like of life is taking shortcuts but it is applying the 80-20 rule which is finding those 20% super efficient methods that leads to those 80% of the results. When this is done well in all aspects of life it does seem like these successful people are having hacks or shortcuts because it becomes a seamless process. The problem nowadays is not having a lack of information but an overload of suggestions on the internet for you to try. So I hope to add the most amount of value to you to save you time to focus on the tried and true methods that get you results efficiently using scientific experiments others have done or ones I've done with thousands of students in the past. And then thirdly which is action. So this is arguably the most important aspect because every action and attempt we take gives us feedback and change to become more efficient. Now if you had the brains of the smartest people in the world combined with that you know all the ways to success but you never acted on anything, you would still be just thinking very efficiently but yielding no results at all. As you can see, the elements in the MMA framework are equally important for you to do well in whatever area you choose to do well in life, including your studies. Now, if you take mindset or methods away from the equation, you risk working very hard but be very inefficient. Now putting in the hours day in and day out, becoming stressed and frustrated, still not achieving anywhere near the results that you want in life. But if you take action away from the equation. Nothing will happen because you'll just be thinking about doing something all day long. So let's kick right into gear and dive right into this. So the first part is mindset. First we're going to talk about why most students are doing study planning the wrong way and this is usually due to three problems. Now number one is study content targeting error. Now as Stephen Covey has said, if the ladder is not leaning against the right wall, every step we take just gets us to the wrong place faster. Now if you never took the time to look at what your exam requires you to learn, you might be spending the time studying things that will never be in the exam or you may be missing out on exam content that will lead to surprise questions during the exam. So number two is the teacher or lecturer over reliance error. Leading on from study content targeting error, a lot of students over rely on their teachers or lecturers. Now this becomes a problem because we haven't applied the principle of having the end in mind, which is a concept from seven habits of highly effective people. And like the title, this principle is indeed effective. Now we need to start with our goal in mind. If our goal is to achieve good enough results, for example, top 10%, while being able to have a lot of free times to do things that we enjoy, we need to find out who is giving us these marks and get them in the most efficient way possible. Often in a lot of high school exams, there is a state or national exam board that sets out this curriculum. Now your teachers then try to teach every single student in the class the contents of this curriculum. The problem now is that there is only one teacher with one teaching style. Then with a class of 30 students, each with their 30 different learning styles. Now don't get me wrong, your teacher is doing the absolute best to try and deliver to every single student in the class. Now if your learning style happens to match your teacher's teaching style then great. Now this is often why students love a particular subject when the teacher clicks with them. But looking at the numbers and the probability game, more often than not you are likely to find a teacher that 
doesn't really match your learning style. Now you now then have two choices. Now first is to blame the teacher, that they're not teaching well and give up on the subject and achieve bad results. Or you can learn to have this end in mind and find out who is giving you these marks and take matters to your own hands to maximize your own chances of success with predictability. I'll be covering in the next method section of how you can specifically do this. So the third error is time allocation error. I was guilty of this myself, studying everything in order because it was feeling great covering everything once or even twice before exams. You feel that you have all bases covered, but then you walk into an exam the next day, you have all sorts of mind blanks. Now you think to yourself, I got everything covered, right? Why am I still getting these mind blanks? How do we actually fix these problems? Now, a way to make you better understand this in relation to your studies would be my brick wall analogy. So the exam tasks you to build a block of brick walls, number one through to number 10. So our first error would be study content targeting error, meaning you are building the wall with hay instead of brick. Now this big bad wolf is just going to come in your, to your house, huff and puff, and you will end up with a chaotic disaster. Now second error of over relying on teachers and lecturers may be them running out of time and teaching you only building number one to number nine but wall number 10 is completely left out then this will be an unpleasant surprise in the exam or if they speak to you in a foreign language meaning their teaching style doesn't speak your learning style and you don't even know that you need to build a wall at all and so this is very dangerous so a third error that I'm personally guilty of during high school is this. So in an ideal world, you should be learning lecture one. And this, you should be building a solid brick wall. Then onto lecture two, then onto another brick wall, and so on until lecture 10. Now you walk into the exams, then you can easily recall everything and achieve 100%. Now as students, we all know that this isn't the case. There's just one tiny flaw that changes the whole logic. Our memory decays over time. So day one, we learn lecture one. It might be a solid wall. Then day two, we learn about lecture two. And we have forgotten a bit about lecture one hence the wall has decayed a bit. Then day three comes and you don't fully understand this topic, so it is a moderate wall. Then day four, you might understand the topic very well and it remains a very solid wall until day 10. And this cycle goes on. The bricks on your wall keeps decaying if you don't come back to review it. So the problem with error three is time allocation error, which what I struggle with is that we study chronologically, meaning we study from lecture one to lecture 10. It feels like we are covering all bases, but in fact, you may be using your time ineffective but when I reach these big holes in the wall, I don't spend enough time covering them because I allocate maybe just one hour to study this. Then when I reach these solid walls, I know them so well, so I don't really need that much time to maintain this solid wall. Now effectively, I'm wasting so much time on these very solid walls where I should have used this more efficiently, repairing these very leaky walls. Now this is where we transition well into the methods section, showing you one of the most efficient ways to tackle this problem. So doing my medical degree back in 2015, I noticed this study efficiency of mine and actually came up with a solution to deal with this which I call the knowledge based timetable. This is where you focus your time on your objectively weakest subjects rather than going through the topics in order which is a traditional time based timetable. Now this is covered very well by Dr. Ali Abdel the study productivity guru himself and he calls this the retrospective timetable and I was very surprised that someone was using the same method as me when I was going through YouTube recently. This analogy explains why this retrospective timetable as Dr. Ali talks about about works very well. So essentially, we go back to these leaky walls more often instead of spending time on the things we know very well. Then there is a whole range of applications you can be using, including Word, Excel, OneNote, and even Notion to help you with this. Now remember, these programs aren't the most important part, but it is how you execute it. So let us walk through how you can use these examples. So first of all, starting off with Word. So this is most original version that I was doing. So switching over to one example right now. So here you can see in the academic folder, uh, first of all, kind of talking about organization, like as you can see since 2006, year 10, like I've been pretty organized and you know, you should probably do so too in terms of your organizing your notes and you know, what should be in here, different subjects and within each subject, there will be notes and also different folders as well. So in particular, when we talk about subject scoping with this, as you can see, say in biology itself, you can see there are different topics already scoped out according to the syllabus itself. And then also in here throughout the semester or throughout the term, we have actually made notes uh, underneath here, summarizing tables, relevant diagrams and all of these. So the main thing I want to get across is don't spend too much time doing this. Rather, we need to spend more time kind of testing ourselves as well. Rather making this, all of these texts white and actually trying to recreate all of this and test ourselves how well we understand it. So I'm going to go through a step-by-step -step process as well. But mainly this here is an example of how you can do it. So 
So all of the learning objectives right up here. And then throughout the semester, we have notes all gathered here. And as you can see, there's a lot of writing, particularly with here. But as you digest it in your own words, might as well later on when you try to recall, rather than writing all of this about glycogen, you might be just saying glycogen, polysaccharide, and you might say that it's highly branched and water soluble. And this already says a lot. So this concept of having context versus compression itself. So when you try to recall things, because you've got all this imagery probably in your brain already as you go through this a few times, so you can just type in a few notes, a few keywords, and you can already know that what you really want to talk about. So this is one key when you're doing notes, you tend to put a lot of context. And then as you recall, you tend to be doing more compression itself. So as you do this, or if I just present this little bit to you or to any Anyone else for that matter it might not make a lot of sense for a lot of people but as you go through it a few times it will make sense to you so this is an example of using word as one of the tools to scope the subject itself so next we'll be looking at subject scoping with Excel which is from one of our students Victoria and uh, she's done a very good job and I'm gonna show you right now so as you can see here, we've got her subjects all scoped out. She's currently in UK doing her A-levels. So she's got biology, chemistry, maths, and psychology. These are old GCSE levels or year 11 equivalent, grade 11 year levels here. So now she's doing a year 12, a year 13 equivalent or A-level equivalent biology here. So as you can see, she has used the website or going to AQA, which is basically the examination board and actually found biology, the A-level biology, and actually scoped out the content, as you can see, biological molecules here. See, 1.1, monomers and polymers. And then cells is the second one. So you can see cells is the second one that she needs to go to. So all of these are scoped out very nicely. And as you can see, even the subtopics right here. And then, so what would happen is that she's already got the key here as well. Every time she say, you know, when you're teacher has finished covering the topics, then I would actually strongly recommend you to come in here, not look at any of these notes because sometimes the syllabus itself gives you some notes. Monomers are the smaller units from which larger molecules are made. So remember from what your teacher have taught, maybe you have made a uh, few notes and also a few questions as well. I'm going to go through this a little bit later. So you can already start to write a few questions in here. What are monomers? So this can be your first question. What are polymers? So this can be your second question and so on. So writing a list of questions that you can really ask yourself. So then you can grade yourself. Okay, I can answer maybe monomers. So now you can, you know, chuck all of this notes away and then you just start testing yourself. Okay, monomers are smaller units from which larger molecules are made. So you answered that correctly. And then you're like, okay, I don't really know what polymers are. And uh, and so say for this one, for representative sake, you might color this orange because you can only color this, uh, you can only answer a few, not all of them. But if you're able to answer all of these, polymers are blah, 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 and answer it right, then you might color this green. So as you go through the topics itself, you already know which ones you need to come back later and which ones you already know very well. And then when it comes to your next study session, what you can really do is to actually color all of this white. So you don't really have an answer anymore. So next study session, maybe this was orange to begin with. Maybe you're coming back to this. Then you can type your answer again because you can't see anything. Okay, monomer are blah 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 polymers are blah 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 and then you can go and see whether your answers are correct either using the syllabus notes itself or you can be doing using the notes that you have already made and synthesized as well and then next time you come in okay maybe maybe this has already turned green so then you might not need to come back to it and also you've got your previous answers here as well so this is how you can use this as a scoping mechanism as well so you can even grade yourself at a topic level how well you're doing in biological model as a summary of all of these or you can do it at a smaller level or even at a question level as well so you can do this throughout your whole chemistry and also your whole mathematics as well as you can see she's already uh, begun doing some of these as well and also even in psychology as well you can probably do this as well so this is how you can use Excel as one of the scoping mechanisms as well so then next is um, another example after Excel would be using OneNote which I heavily relied on during medical school and I'm gonna show you a little bit about how I was scoping my subjects and how I was filling out my subjects as well so with medicine itself as an example 
example, so I've got the OSCE topics here, as you can see. So OSCE is uh, basically a short form of a oral examination, a final final examination before medical students become fully fledged doctors. So this is a very high stakes exam. So as you can see, all of these, I kind of scoped it out in terms of kind of stations. So you, as you can see, general medicine um, and general practice or surgery, how many stations are occupying each of these? And our, we were actually trying to also predict what's going to come out. So level one are the, are the things that we need to cover more often. Level two are the things that, you know, might be coming up, but maybe less often. And also what kind of skills that we need to be uh, doing as well. So in surgery, you know, different topics as well, pain and anesthesia, oncology. So all of these different things that we need to cover. So what it really turned into was this. So with the scoping that we did previously, we then made different practice stations using the learning objectives or using uh, the most common stations that might come out as an oral examination as well. So we actually made our own stations which actually greatly helped our active recall and our understanding of topic because when we make this station we were actually testing other students so then in order to test people we need to understand the topic very well. So this worked very well in terms of still using as you can see um, we are still using the same concept of active recall and also space repetition as we continue to actually repeat these stations again and again and actually testing ourselves in different formats. So as you can see, even in medical school, even in the high stakes exam, it's the, still the same process, the same effective study methods that we can use. So another example would be the written exam itself. As you can see, there's a ton of uh, notes here in different disciplines, even in pediatrics itself, we can go by either conditions, different medical conditions by itself or presentations because people don't typically present with appendicitis or you know an inflamed bowel they come in with tummy pain right so that is how another way that we scope our subjects as well because we were actually in our syllabus we could be examined by either presentation that's why we actually scoped our subjects and filled our subjects with uh, rash for example also abdominal pain for example a child with a fever for example so this is another way of subject scoping within medicine as well and as you can see psychiatry the same thing within anxiety disorders we scope the whole thing and within each of these it would be a similar format you know etiology meaning what caused it and you know how do we approach our assessment and what's the criteria of this particular thing so when we come to study we actually probably don't don't look at it and we just go uh, what is the cause of acute stress disorder or what is the management of acute stress disorder or what is the prognosis of ASD and we just start testing ourselves and then we can just refer to the notes up top and go this example coming from one of the students as well all right I've messed up this 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 and that this is what I'm going to color for example my these questions itself and then you can actually give it a color on the side as well as you go as you scope the subject and as you test yourself as well so this is using one note so next, we've got using another program called Notion. I've been using this pretty much daily right now, managing different things, putting notes and things. So this is a relatively new thing around at block and uh, you can consider using this as well. And I believe it's free as well. So as you can see, the student itself, so you can see the course curriculum is already linked here so if you actually click that link you can see that there is the learning outcomes and and so on here so as you can see with this particular thing with this particular electrochemistry and then down below there will be thermal chemistry so that's the next one and then the good thing about this is you can create pages so you can click into this and then it will have different subtopics and then within each topics you can also do these things called the drop down as well and then you the good thing is that you can put notes underneath these drop downs and you can start testing yourself really and this way you can be blocking out this so this becomes a giant flashcard as you make notes in this this can become a giant flashcard so as you define a redox reaction as you you know do all of these things as well this is how you can make your notes work for you and to do your subject scoping as well or if you you can also do things like make a background to it so you know that which of these are which of these you already know very well and which of these you actually need to come back so I don't know if it's not coming back as green so that should be green as well so red orange and green so then you know which ones you need to come back to until you know you test yourself on these again and it becomes orange or green so these are all means to an end so you can choose to to do any one of these but the important thing is that you do a subject scoping no matter which program you use because it provides you with a crystal clear plan on what you need to do in the next study session so if you don't know how 
how to find these learning objectives. I've also covered this in a separate video guiding you step by step on how to find these learning objectives yourself no matter where you are in the US, in the UK, in Australia, in New Zealand. So knowing the mindset and what to do is only the first step. So how do you actually apply this to your own studies throughout the term or semester? What do you do if you are just starting school or uni versus if you are just a few weeks away from your final exams? So let's dive right into this. So before the term or semester starts, this is where the mindset work is so important. Just like the little mindset part that we've done with our particular study planning. There is so much for other things. For example, building a better routine, building better habits, including having better sleep how do you experiment so you can actually have better sleep and how do you actually gain more energy maybe by adjusting your diet and your exercise routine because all of this is very important because it becomes a sustainable habit and routine that you can actually use throughout your term and semester so maximize your performance during that and secondly with the subject scoping which is a big chunk of our study planning that we've covered now is actually getting the semester ready once you have all your subjects scoped you are ready to tackle the semester so once you're during the semester most of your time will be focusing on your knowledge based timetable the examples that we've given you in Word, in Excel, in OneNote, in Notion or whatever program you choose to use. Once you have this knowledge based timetable set out, this is what you need to be focusing. Going through what you haven't covered first and testing yourself with the active recall principle. And then next, most important is to test yourself and turn all of this red knowledge to orange knowledge and then to green knowledge. And then after that, focusing on these particular topics if you have small topic tests and turn these knowledge from red to green. And then if you are just two to four weeks away from your big exams, now is really the time to refresh all the learning objectives because our memory decays over time and there are some learning objectives that you may not have revisited that has gone past weeks or even months so once you have done that and you have an updated list of your knowledge red orange and green then you focus all your efforts on turning all of this red knowledge to orange and green so now we are one week away from exams so by now most of your knowledge should be green you should now be actually using pre-written practice exam questions written by you or actual past exam questions to actually gauge what is covered in the exam and how well you are actually performing. So if we are now one day before exams, you should plan out well for the next day and reduce the amount of thinking required on the day. So setting out all your stationary needs, your clothes, your layer of clothes, where you're going to eat, what you're going to eat, when exactly you're going to leave home and where exactly you're going to arrive in terms of the exam hall. Now this is all part of this process called reducing your cognitive load on the big day. So you can actually focus on delivering well in the exam itself. Now having coached many, many students, we know that having just the knowledge to do well doesn't automatically equal success. So if you want more in-depth study tips, also me to hold you accountable for you to succeed and an amazing high achieving community to help with you and your studies, make sure to check out our website below and consider joining our exclusive study community. Otherwise, I hope this mini lesson has been helpful for you and I look forward to seeing you in the next one.